Hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation that we're having with on the subject of creative habits and how one might live a creative life. We are really excited to dig in with you. So please take a second to type in the chat a little bit about um, what is it to live a creative life? How would you define that? Or what would be something special about it? You could choose a single word that to you embodies it, or you can make a longer description, but we'd love to hear that. I am joined by three of my teammates who I've taught with before. And so we'll just go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Heidi Parks. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I do a lot of hand quilting and hand piecing, sometimes machine piecing, mostly improvisational quilts. And I do a lot of both exhibiting quilts and teaching quilting. So we can just go in the order that we will be presenting in if you would like to introduce yourselves next. I think that's me. Um, I, I'm Libs Elliott. I live here in Toronto, Canada. And um, I've been quilting for about 12 years. I often use computer programming as part of my quilt design. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I do a lot of teaching. Uh, I design for Andover fabrics. So I have fabric collections. I design quilt patterns. Um, and once in a while, when I'm lucky, I get to participate in quilt shows too. So I'm happy to be here. I'm excited. All right. Hi, I am Carolyn Friedlander, and I live in Lake Wales, Florida, which is right in the center of the state. Um, I uh, have been quilting since about 2007, 2008, something like that, um, but sewing most of my life or around sewing. Um, these days, I am a fabric designer, and I also am a, I write sewing patterns, um, do some teaching, do participate in quilt shows from time to time. Um, yeah, just love quilting. So yeah, super excited to be here, part of this conversation. Excellent. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tara Sonnen, and I live in Oakland, California. And um, I have been quilting for, you know, over 20 years, but have only been really running a full-time quilting business for the last few years. So I've really had to redefine what it means to live a creative life <laughs> um, in the last few years. And um, I write uh, patterns, quilt patterns, and I teach. And I think that's it for right now. <laughs> I feel like there's so much more. Um, every once in a while, I enter quilts into QuiltCon, and that's about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, welcome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Oops. I, sorry, I was just trying to share something. Okay. Um, so we are each going to share a little bit, kind of a similar uh, schedule that we use for soft bulk, and then we will have a conversation together. So I will be beginning. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So uh, if you've been following along on YouTube Live, you know that I'm teaching a diary quilting class right now, and that it is a pretty exciting thing for me. I've been interviewing other uh, artists who work with diary, both quilters as well as a photographer and a painter. And uh, as I've been teaching, we've had a lot of mingling sessions. So there have been a lot of nice casual times where I've been talking to students and getting to hear some of their insights and their questions. And one of the really wonderful thought-provoking questions that I've had is from a student whose first name is Kasha. And she was just so wonderfully asking, like, I get that I'm adding to the diary. I get that I want to be curious and keep you know, I can't know what will happen in my life going forward. So I can't plan what this diary quilt will look like when it's done. But how do I make it pretty? Like, how do we make it aesthetically pleasing or beautiful? And it's been such a fun question to roll around and to return to. So I thought I would share a little bit more about that 
uh, with everyone today, because I think that for me is really integral to living a creative life. I think that life itself can be really messy and have a lot of problematic things coming up or can just be stressful or not the way I wanted it to be, right? If I had sat down when I was 18 and, and mapped out what I wanted my life to be, that was a very different blueprint from what I'm working with today. And with all the ups and downs, how do I make my life one that feels beautiful or one that feels pretty? And for me, the microcosm of the studio is like proof that it can be done. <laughs> if I can give myself these limiting circumstances where I don't know how it will go or what will turn out and it can still turn out well, then maybe life itself can also. So um, that I suppose is one of the most potent ways that, that I think about living a creative life and how that creativity mirrors the potential for my life itself. So here are just a few quilts that I made improvisationally that are diary based that I think turned out beautiful and pretty. So this is a quilt that I made when I was daydreaming about teaching in France. It was scheduled. We'd sold the spaces it was going to happen and then I was going to show the quilt top to my students in France in June 2020 and then maybe I would quilt it afterwards and that of course did not happen and many months later I saw this poor little quilt top lurking in the corner and I thought I better just finish it so the gap between quilting and quilt top was a large one. And sometimes when I get used to looking at it as a quilt top, I get so set in that that I forget it's going to change again. And it can be really intimidating to quilt. And just the, the, the feeling tied in knots that I had around uh, my plans changing inspired me to incorporate a lot of knots on the surface of the quilt. And now looking at it, I feel like that texture, the way that there's a separate drawing on the top with the quilts that does on top of the applique where the quilting feels somewhat disconnected from the quilt top is a source of the beauty that, uh, for me at least, something that creates beauty in a quilt is tension. If, if there's something uncomfortable that's being bridged. So for me, that really different pattern of little rainbows and scallops in the quilting versus the, the shapes and the roundness of the quilt top is part of what creates that tension that makes it really aesthetically pleasing. There are two things to unpack and decipher. This quilt, again, was a total surprise to me that I was going to layer scraps underneath. I was trying to make a quilt about how I have floaters in my eyes and I see little gray spots whenever I look at things. And it's something that I didn't know happened as a person ages. And I, was not, I was not prepared to have floaters. And I wanted to put the viewer into the situation that I feel that I'm in and, and that the floaters, those little gray bits that are submerged underneath the quilt top above the batting are disorienting and tell a different story from the embroidery on the quilt top. And that again, there's this source of tension and mirroring life, but now looking at it finished, I feel like that is one of the most beautiful parts of this quilt, that it has this floaty ethereal uh, feeling to it. This is a quilt that I made during the pandemic and it was a daily practice for a hundred days to keep adding to it and the the abundance in it is something really striking because I made the commitment to add and add and add and add and so I had to keep finding space on the quilt to keep adding things and that sense of abundance and the way that I forced myself perhaps to go further with applique and embroidery than I naturally would made it really beautiful and exciting. This quilt I made when I was in Santa Fe and was thinking a lot about childhood memories in Santa Fe and my grandmother who uh, is, has, has dementia and isn't quite the grandmother of my 
memory. Um, think, thinking about her and reminiscing about those days when she was just so vivacious when I was in fifth grade and and high and junior high. So there's you know, this touch of sadness, but also a real sense of joy. And I think that juxtaposition of sorrow and joy comes through in the quilt, creating that sense of tension and excitement in the work. I also am a huge fan of a skinny line, <laughs> a long skinny line. It's something so satisfying to me or when things are super close to each other, but not quite touching. And I'm not sure exactly when I learned that I loved that as an aesthetic, but it is something that now returns again and again in my work because it's something I know that I find beautiful. And if I can have this little list, I haven't written it down. I probably should. It would probably push my work forward in a great way. But I have this mental list of things that I know I find beautiful in a quilt and both things being really long and skinny as well as being so close but not quite touching. Very, very satisfying to me. Another aesthetic that's satisfying within this quilt is just having a buildup of texture. So here, for example, I had to, I was teaching in Santa Fe, so I had to do a bunch of demos and I thought, let me show the acute angle and reverse applique and the running stitch and the whip stitch and the ladder stitch in these tan colors and it can represent the dust storm, the once every 50 years dust storm that we experienced in Santa Fe. And that was an easy low stakes way to begin on the quilt where it's not the focal point, but that abundance of texture adds something that to me is very beautiful. Um, this quilt felt a bit chaotic and then the quilting being black and all over to me helped create a sense of unity. So sometimes trusting that the quilting phase will create unity and calm within the work is a really um, helpful thing to lean into. This is a quilt that I made as a diary of my artist residency at Have Company with Marley Grace in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2015. And I almost freaked out and didn't sew it the way I was planning to. And then I thought, no, let me stay the course. Maybe once I add these long, skinny blue lines in between the strip quilting, maybe it will do what I want. And so you know, sometimes just having, having some faith in the plan is helpful. It's also so many prints, but they're all unified by a sand color. There's a sandiness in them, which connected to the Beach Monday tradition that we were there. So it added to the diary aspect, which is a little bit um, ambiguous there, but it's very inspired by Beach Monday with the waves crescendoing in the quilt. And that sandiness in all of the prints helps them work together. This is a, um, another another quilt top and I don't want to dig too much in because I know I'm getting close to the end of my time but another one that I found unexpectedly beautiful as it continued and then a scrap quilt of just follow, following setting up some rules and seeing where they took me and then being really surprised when I decided to add a dark batting instead of a traditional white batting and had that um, lit it up and made it really exciting to look at so the current quilt that I'm working on right now is one that, like so many of my quilts, when I'm really jazzed about them in the beginning and I share them on Instagram, I think people will love them like I do, and they just don't see uh, the potential in them the way that I do. So this is the kind of photo that I post, and I'm so excited, and then like crickets on the internet. And... Um, staying the course with that kind of thing is really important. And so here I wanted to begin with a lot of texture, which I know I find very beautiful. And I wanted to challenge myself to have a colorful background instead of a white background. And then I, I wanted to spice it up, but of course you can't <laughs> do, or I didn't want to do that in the beginning. So it had this awkwardness of being, a very muted color palette. And then it had even more awkwardness of adding one, one shape that feels very out of place. So embracing those awkward moments on the way to creating that tension that makes a work of art beautiful for me. 
Uh, so now I've added more color and I feel like it's starting to come alive and have some visual movement. And then the current state of the quilt is here. And so it's starting to create this really interesting round shape in the middle. It's made out of a, a sweater that doesn't fit me and that even if it did, I wouldn't wear it because it's not my style anymore. Um, I used to, this is another Ann Top Taylor loft garment. <laughs> they seem to continue continuously make their way into my work. And so here I need to now attach this other sweater. And I'm thinking a lot about warmth as my word here in 2023. And I thought, what better way to infuse warmth in the work than with an actual literal sweater? So both the pink and hot pink are sweaters. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. And that's a little bit of where I am with creative living. So over to Liz. That's great. Thanks, Heidi. I love seeing the progress on some of those that I haven't seen photos of for a while and how they're coming along. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. And I love how differently we work. Um, and I'll get into this and how much I really feel like there are two things that I've been really reflecting on lately since we started, the four of us started gathering together and since we started doing the um, creative habits workshop and how that's affected my work. Um, and not just the four of us, but the you know quilting and sewing community um, in a larger capacity. So these are some quilts that uh, I made about 10 years ago. And if you're not familiar with my work, a lot of my work um, is generated randomly using a programming language. So it's all highly, um, <laughs> it starts out very digital. Uh, and other than the randomization, so when I run this code, it gives me a random design. And then I'll take that design, other than that bit of random chaos and excitement, um, these are highly planned. So I get the, the code outputs this beautiful visual, um, but then I have to break it down and plan out these quilts. Uh, they look exactly the way when they come to fruition, they're identical to what I saw on my screen. So there isn't any real play. And um, I found comfort in that, in having this really set I loved the chaos and excitement at the beginning of the process, but then I also found a lot of comfort in this, you know, repetition and process that was very controlled. Um, and when I was doing a lot of making these quilts like this, I was working very much in a silo. I wasn't really part of a quilting community, um, but over the years, you know, I've become more, started teaching more and gotten more involved with quilting groups. Um, and currently, right now, I've got a Patreon page, and uh, my patrons and I have started connecting um, on Zoom every every other week, and I'm going to be scheduling more virtual sewing sessions where we just get together and sew together, um, because I've been finding a lot of comfort also in community. But I feel like something interesting is happening, where... I find comfort in these community groups and these sewing circles and, and like what we do with our mastermind. Um, there's growth happening there and there's comfort, but creatively it's the opposite where there's comfort happening here. I did this for almost 10 years. I really stuck to this methodology and this process and there's no growth in comfort when you're just doing what you know how to do creatively. So I feel like last year was this amazing growth spurt for me through the um, activities that we did together and with our larger community where I was able to just break away from these processes and, and try new things. Um, and not that I don't love this work. Um, I really do love the whole process behind it. And it's, to me, it's always been really intriguing the, the way that I use like something that's digital and that's not physical and I make it into something physical and functional. Um, but I like how it's progressed, but I feel like I just need to even push myself even further. 
So here are two other pieces, you know, the one on the left hand side, again, very mathematical, very repetitive. I like I like that visually, it's calming to me uh, to see something that's really nice and repetitive and clean. Um, the one on the, the right is one that I started two years ago. It was probably the most challenging quilt and it's actually a true representation of a digital piece that um, was generated by one of my, my co-collaborator, Joshua Davis. So he created the digital version and then I've been building this one and I've just been stuck. You can see that bottom corner is empty and I've been stuck on it because it's like all these tiny little pieces. Um, and while I was building it, my father passed away. So it was like this really, it's become this really heavy piece for me. So I'm just starting to get to this point where I'm like, why do I need to stick to my comfort zone by following exactly what the visual is that Josh gave to me? Why can't I break it? Why can't I make that corner different from the digital version and make it more representative of where I'm at now? So I'm starting to explore a new way of finishing that piece rather than just following the rules that have always followed. Um, so I'm excited finally to get back to that piece where it was before feeling really heavy. And I think a lot of that comes out of this permission that I started to give myself because of the little exercises that we started to do together. So here's an example of some of these exercises. These were these mini challenges that we did. And each one just helped to push me out of that comfort zone and uh, really explore new ways, new shapes, new ways of making. Um, so those are all our, our four little challenges. And then some of Tara's uh, paper collages that we did. And then it helped to really not just do these little mini challenges, um, but to open my eyes more as and be more present in my surroundings. So creatively just walking through the building where my studio is, I was, I saw this like this wooden crate and it was sitting at the, at the uh, dumpster. And I was like, oh my God, look how, look at the shapes in that. That's so cool. And where in the past I would have just walked past it because aesthetically um, and process wise, it didn't fit my the way I make quilts I would have just been oh whatever but this time I was like I noticed it I took a photo of it I was inspired by it and you know it just helped to really open my eyes um, so I think going through these little exercises has really expanded on my creativity um, and it's really pushed me out of my comfort zone so that's where I am right now I'm in this really uncomfortable place creatively but it feels good like, okay, what am I going to do next? What am I going to try next? Uh, and one of those things too, is to just stitch without a plan. So like Heidi is very, does a lot of intuitive stitching. And so for her mini challenge, oh no. So, you know, for, for something like this, I was like, what can I do with, I've got these fabric paints. What can I do with them? They've been sitting in my studio forever. And I just thought, why not play around with the paints on fabric? So I, you know, put blobs on, folded them up, opened them up, and now I've got these really cool, a few different pieces that maybe I'll stitch, but it's gone from something that's very highly planned to, I'm going to put this paint on this fabric. I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see how it goes. I don't even know if I'm doing this right, <laughs> you know, and just playing around with the process and figuring out how to make an image like this work. So I use like um, some acrylic plastic and I put the paint on there and then I folded it over and with the fabric and unfolded it and it opened up into these really cool like Rorschach like images. So it was just one of those little like giving myself permission to experiment and take time um, to do small things rather than, I mean, even the piece behind me is like a highly planned spending hours focusing on one thing and it's like, if I don't have time, why not just spend a few minutes a day just working on some of these little fun projects and see if they go somewhere. So the intuitive stitching, this is another thing. Like I have this pair of jeans that I love and they're falling apart <laughs> really badly. And for the longest time they've been sitting on a shelf. And after like sitting and just stitching with Heidi for a session, I just thought, I don't have to have a plan for these. I knew I wanted to stitch them and, and build up strength in the denim. Um, 
but I thought I don't actually have to have a plan. So every night I sit in bed and I just add some more stitches to them and we'll see where they go. Like they're probably gonna be end up being very wacky pants, <laughs> but, um, but it's really nice feeling to just let go and try something different and stitch for the sake of stitching um, and get out of your comfort zone. So, but I fi find that, so now I'm finding comfort in my community um, and I'm finding a nice balance of uncomfort, discomfort in my creative practice by doing all these little things. And I think that's really shaking things up for me. Um, and I'm excited about where these things are gonna go this year. So we'll see, but that's where I'm at. And I do feel like this is also informing like um, classes, workshops that I'm developing. I used to, my workshops were always very, very technical and you know straight lines and things like that. Um, or, you know, um, yeah, very planned. And now I'm like, wait, I could do not necessarily improv workshops, but um, expand it to new things, new ideas that I've been playing around with. So it's just opening up a whole new world for me, which is, I, it feels great. So I'm feeling good. <laughs> and then even if I don't have a lot of time during the day, um, I might just play around for a few minutes. So, you know, my days are getting kind of, uh, have been pretty crazy this month and going into February, it's gonna be busy. But even if I just pull out a few fabrics from my stash and stack different fabrics and play with um, color palettes that I'm not used to and take photographs, then I've got something I can always reference uh, and look back on if I wanna pull from that again. Or if I've got little scraps sitting on my table, like I always do, why not put them together? spend you know 15 minutes and make a little tiny mini swatch type um, piece. So and then this little piece on the left, I think you know it, it's exciting. Maybe it'll go into something bigger. Maybe it could go into you know a diary type quilt if I was working on something that Heidi's inspired. So yeah, I'm just doing these tiny little things I think can really help relieve that stress of the other ways I have to be creative during the day, which are way, things like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna feed the kids? Or how am I gonna get across the city in 35 minutes? Those are ways I have to be creative and it's not that fun. <laughs> These are the fun little things that I can do to relieve that, that tension. So um, yeah, so that's what I've been up to lately. Not a lot of time, but still time to do little play sessions for sure. I love seeing your jeans. Those are kind of new for me. I know. I'm, ex I'm excited about them. <laughs> I might wear them to quilt con, even if they're not finished. Like who knows when they'll be finished. Just one of those. I could just keep stitching. So, mm. see. All right, Carolyn, take it away. All right. Um, yeah, this is such uh, such an exciting topic, um, and it's been really fun to see already how um, you, Heidi, and 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 Libs have have taken you know this idea of what it means to live a creative life um, because I think it is such a personalized thing. But I can totally relate to everything that both of you have just shared. Um, so yeah, let me um, share my screen and. No. All right. Um, when I think about, oops, uh, when I think about living a creative life, um, I just think about how creativity has really been with me always, um, not in the same form. Uh, it's kind of ebbed and flowed, not even in ways that I can have necessarily realized. Um, and so creativity for me uh, started, you know, I grew up on a cattle and citrus ranch. And, um, you know, I loved it. it. It was all I knew. But looking back now, I think about just the the opportunities for creativity and play that were involved. Um, I just remember um, spending time down at the barn and finding all kinds of treasures and, you know, all of these mysterious things that I didn't know what they did, but we used them to play with me and my siblings. And it was just always fun. Um, figuring out that kind of stuff. Um, 
And then sewing also is another thing that I thought of as far as my, my creative kind of history. I grew up around sewing and uh, very early on going on to the fabric stores with my mom uh, and being able to pick out a pattern for some clothes and then pick out fabric to go along with it. And so already from the beginning, it was just the idea that um, you could really use your imagination to um, combine different ideas, taking a pattern and then taking fabric and imagine kind of what that would become if that would be something that 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 could suit suit uh, something that I wanted to wear as a kid. So that was exciting. So um, as I got kind of older, I was definitely uh, into like drawing and continuing like uh, with creativity and being, um, I don't know, pursuing that as a potential profession. <laughs> so I studied uh, architecture and worked in the field for a few years. And that was great. But eventually, um, I don't know, I came back around to quilting. Um, <laughs> gosh, excuse me. Um, and uh, yeah, I discovered quilting kind of after I got out of college and was working. And um, and yeah, uh, it, it just became this totally new tool for me and I became completely obsessed. So, you know, some of these earlier things that I was excited about, this is a view of my parents' ranch. I uh, quickly realized that quilting was this new tool that I could use, similar to like what I'd studied in school. It was really like drawing, but with kind of new materials and new tools, new process. And so um, for my creative self, it was just very satisfying to have this new um, new thing to explore. Um, and so quilting then became uh my new career <laughs> over a few years i um developed you know pattern line and sort of started moving into um you know designing fabric and writing patterns and so creativity became more in the forefront for me professionally um which has been great designing fabrics um here are just some of my patterns that i've come out with over, over the years um, again, these are things that it, it, it has been really fun for me to kind of merge my creative self. So things that I'm interested in, like how shapes interact, um, my outhouse quilt, uh, I actually I have an outhouse at my house from the previous owners. It's quirky, but it was fun to kind of take that inspiration and, you know, make a project with it. Um, so just for me, uh, quilting has been such a great way to, um, interpret things that I see and I'm interested in and inspired by into like, um, you know, these physical items, these, these pieces, um, and then being able to share that with other people. And so, um, it's not just been quilts and patterns, um, but I've been able to use quilting in other aspects of my life. Uh, this was a couch that uh, started as a quilt, two quilts that I then cut up and turned into a couch because I had a need. Um, I love how creativity can help us satisfy needs. <laughs> um, making clothes, uh, love making clothes still. And I love merging that with ideas from uh, a lot of my patterns. And so one thing that's been really, uh, really kind of exciting for me over the last, especially the last year, and then, you know, along with uh, this group, thinking about creativity and creative habits and stuff was just really being able to look closer at um, the habits that I've developed um, over time <laughs> and what creativity means in my life, my creative self, and then also really recognizing kind of the ebbs and flow of, of those things. Um, and so, cause it doesn't all have to look the same, you know, it, it, for me, it started out, you know, as being a kid being one thing, but then, you know, even over the course of all of these images, how much it's changed. These are some of my more recent quilts. Um, and so lately, um, I liked how Libs, you were talking about like comfort and discomfort in your quilting. Uh, I can totally relate to that. Um, something for me recently and especially since putting together the the creative habits program is just thinking about like curia curiosity and kind of exploration um those are kind of front of mind for me creatively these days um here's just 
some, here are some images from my phone from the last few weeks. <laughs> so since we did the program, um, I love, uh, I've got a sweater that I'm working on. So there's always some kind of handwork project. I made some Christmas gifts that's on the bottom left. Um, and then just snapping pictures of places that I've seen and kind of all together, it's just the idea that creativity for me is not just one thing, but it's kind of all of these little snippets that, um, that you can kind of put together and, uh, I don't know, explore and be open to where they might take you in, in, in the work to come. And so, um, this is a project that I've been working on. Um, it's just a fun project uh that's not for work <laughs> but it's one uh that i'm making for a friend and that was kind of one of my biggest realizations uh after the program was just kind of giving myself uh like letting it be okay that i work on a personal project uh, i think that that had kind of become one of my personal challenge creative challenges um is just that you know in also making a living on my creativity um it can be easy to fall into the trap where um, it feels like everything that you do creatively must be some kind of product, must serve some kind of productive need. And um, I think that one of the important things about, you know, really living a sustainable creative life is making sure to keep that interest and excitement alive. Um, and a lot of times that, that, that means allowing yourself to go down paths that you don't know where they'll lead and they might lead nowhere. They might be completely unproductive, but um, if it's something that you're interested in, then it's worth pursuing. And so already with this quilt, um, I don't know, it's just been really fun to cut through um, using, I guess, mostly all of my fabrics. Um, so fabrics that I designed, you know, when I first started to recent ones, it's been really fun mixing them together. And then I also just don't piece projects like this very much at all. Um, so from like a technical standpoint, um, it's just been such a good physical like challenge for me, like building up different kind of um, muscle memory for when I'm piecing for these types of shapes. And um, that alone has just uh, brought so much for me. So that is kind of where I am at creatively. Um, and yeah, that's another project, but. All right. Okay. Carolyn, I loved seeing your drawings from back in the day and the architecture, the visuals of the architecture side of you. It was a fun, it was a fun time. It was a fun time. Yeah, because I think just like kind of quilting uh, has, you know, in more recent years become a good lens for like understanding things that I'm interested in the world, uh, studying architecture and doing those kinds of drawings was really very similar in that it was about, you know, looking at an issue and figuring out how to represent it um, with the tools of that time being, you know, drawing tools and chipboard and whatever else to make a model with. So um, that was definitely a big uh yeah, big, big moment for me in my, I guess, creative development was, was recognizing that. Yeah. All right, Tara, take it away. Make okay. Sure yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I mean, you guys have said it all. Like, as you were talking, I was like, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, but I'll just, <laughs> I'll share, I'll share my, um, let me start my timer so I don't go too long. Um, you know, yeah, in thinking about what it means to have a creative life, um, and definitely I had a big aha moment, um, actually, before I even start sharing, well, I'll just share because you guys can see me. Uh, when I was talking to you guys the other day, I was really, you know, I had a, this moment that where I realized that it can mean many things to be an artist, that when, and, and in thinking about it a lot more, you know, when I used to quilt for the last 20 years, it was diving in and creating this one big quilt and just going in for like a week and being there and doing that. And that has not been able to, to, I haven't been able to do that for the last couple of years. And I felt like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, 
keeping up my practice or whatever that means, but I've had to rethink about what, what does it mean to be an artist? And it, I don't know why I told myself this lie that it meant this one thing that you go in, you make these big quilts. And in looking at it, to me, it's just the constant practice of being creative. I mean, just because you're not producing a big painting or a big quilt doesn't mean you're not an artist. You suddenly cease to be an artist. <laughs> so I don't know why I told myself that lie, but that was the lie. And it's amazing after our creative Rets class, like I really um, started to, to break down some of those some of those preconceptions and re-embrace being both a business owner and a creative artistic quilter. Like it doesn't, that's otherwise it has to be one or the other. Um, and then so in putting together this, this presentation for you guys, I was like, Oh yeah, there's so many ways to be creative. It doesn't mean that you have to be this one thing or this other thing. Um, and I think that the key is it needs to evolve as you, your life circumstances evolve. So for me, one of the things is just make, 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 make all the time with no conception. I did this all summer. I was making these hexagons uh, all summer long because I just didn't have the bandwidth. I was too busy doing other things. So I just sit there and make these hexagons. I still haven't done anything with them. I've done some little mini studies. I did that. It's just like a 20 by 20. I did that. It's a little bit bigger. It's all put together, folded up in a box. I did that. <laughs> so I've just done all of these things with these hexagons. This is a little purse I made for my three-year-old niece. Um, but the important thing to me is just to make. Um, something that's important is to be messy and be clean. It doesn't have to be one way. I've always told myself I'm a mess creator, but you know what? Sometimes I'm a kind of a neat and clean creator. Um, just be where you are, right? I definitely need to get out and recharge in water, near water, on water, by water, river. I found this whale skeleton a couple of weeks ago by the ocean. I love that expression I thought I'd share with you guys. This recharges me. Um, and I used to recharge by coming into my studio and sewing a quilt. That was how I found my creativity. And now I have to recharge by getting out of the studio because so much of my time is spent in here. Um, so recharging is like skating by water, near water, not on water, being out in gorgeous sunset. So those are ways now that I recharge, I garden, like all of these things, like get out of the studio. And absolutely, you guys, I'm not kidding. The 20 years before this, all of my free time, basically, for the most part, was spent in my studio. And now it's kind of the opposite. And so this is another project of making, just making on repeat sewing at night. I just was hand sewing these, didn't know what to do, but at night I watch TV and I sew and I don't know ever what's going to happen with these little things that I start on the couch. That's why I love that practice of sewing on the couch while watching TV, because there's no plan, you know, you're on your lap. And in going through photos, you know, for the last few months, I've been really, really wanting to be creative and to dive into these large quilts. Cause I, again, the lie that you have to make this large quilt in order to be an art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm laughing at myself. Um, and so because I don't have the time to, to dive into something like that for a week, like a large quote for myself, working on making time, because uh, it is important to fill the well uh, and do those personal projects when you were just talking about that, Carolyn, I was like, yes, so important. Uh, but what I have been able to make time for is small things, bits pieces, pieces that won't go anywhere. And I, I literally think about these like a sketchbook, you know, we, as quilters, I think because we have, we create a product at the end, we're often, um, I've been thinking about lies that we tell ourselves, the lies that I tell myself that it has to be something that's useful or done or complete. Um, and nobody ever questions somebody who paints or draws their sketchbook. Like what's the point of a sketchbook? Well, it's just a sketch. So I, that's what I think about these little bits, um, these little pieces or these makings that go nowhere. And it's not that they go nowhere. They're exactly where they should be. They're just sketches. They're just moving your hands and being creative. Um, so all these little pieces don't have to be anything. They just are what they are. <laughs> I like that. Um, that thought has really kind of helped me along in the last few months. Um, so just making, making little things because that's fun. Why not? And then I always am like, oh, should I finish it? Should I quilt it? 
no, not necessarily. It doesn't need to be finished or quilted. It is. Um, and, and recently I, I take class once a year, I take a week long class with my quilt group and we did these little, and it was so outside of my comfort zone. You guys, I'm not a modern minimalist, you know, it's just not who I am. I'm like a maximalist who uses traditional quilt blocks, but it's so fun to go outside of your comfort zone and play. And this really recharges me when I take these classes every year. Um, and so we were playing in this class with these just little paper maquettes and putting them into a room and, you know, a fake room a photo. Um, and so I just, I just went to town with these little pieces of paper. I had so, so much fun. And this is really creatively recharges me to get out of my comfort zone as well. Um, none of them have to become a quilt. This does not have to become my voice, but if I was a minimalist quilter, what would my quilts look like? You know, so that's kind of a fun hat to try to put on. Um, if I was going to use three or four colors, what would those colors be? You know, how, how do they, and I feel like when I look at these, I'm like, oh yeah, that looks like me. Um, and so that was part of that play is like, okay, I'm going to do these uh, really minimalist quilts. And what is, what does minimalism look like to me? Is it about line or just these subtle, these subtle things? So just making those little little bits. That's all the stuff that came out of the class. Um, that's what I spent five days doing. <laughs> Those little things or four days. <laughs> Oftentimes I make and it goes nowhere, just throwing spaghetti on the wall. It's so important to me um, to not have a plan. Sometimes I have a plan, but it's also important to me, I should say, to not have a plan sometimes and just see what happens. Nothing came out of that. I ended up making that with all those bits and pieces. <laughs> I rearranged them into that. <laughs> um, and that was really pleasing to me. This is a quilt that went nowhere. I think, in fact, think went into the scrap bin because I just didn't feel like resolving the problems that and the construction when I just, I don't know, I lost interest. Great. I did it. It took me like three days. I had fun. And then I put it into the scrap bin. This is a quilt that went nowhere. Would love for it to go somewhere, but it went nowhere. I don't know why. And sometimes it's about that process of like not not knowing where where I'm going and and being able to play because some you know I have to do so many quilts. I don't even it's not even have to. I get to. I get to do so many quilts for uh, business purposes for pattern making, and often with those quilts I do kind of have a plan. And um, so, so, so sometimes it's really freeing to approach design without a plan. And that's usually the approach that I take for myself and my own quilts. But when I'm doing a quilt for a pattern, I definitely plan it out quite a bit more. It's really different. There's like these different approaches that I take. Um, but I was making this quilt when I was at a really low creative point this summer. And I just started making four patch blocks because I thought, well, how can I break it down to the simplest thing? <laughs> I was like, okay, four patch. I can start with a four patch and I'm just going to make four patches because I, um, I was coming up to a season where I have to, um, I had to create eight quilt patterns in the last, I don't know, four months, five months. And so that's a really big draw on my creativity. And so before I did that, I was like, you know what I need to do is I just need to play and make a quilt for myself. Don't know where it's going to go. That's where I ended up going. And after that, I made three quilts in three weeks and three quilt patterns because I was so charged up and I was so excited. And, um, and then I just kind of had to redo that whole thing where I had to like make something for myself so that I could recharge and like bring that creative energy forward. Um, so that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, it's all the things it's, it's all the things it's trying to, uh, evolve. And definitely I'm in a place of evolving and thinking about everything that we've been talking about with creative habits in the last few months. It's been an amazing journey to reinvent myself and what it means to be creative. So yeah, that's it. Did I do 10 minutes? We're, we're doing so perfectly on time. It's amazing. Oh, excellent. My mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I put into the chat that if people have um, any questions for us, they're welcome to comment and ask, but otherwise we can um, 
banter with each other. I feel like I have lots of questions and exciting things to share based on what everyone has shared. Uh, but it's just lovely to see people are joining us. Um, Colorado is a popular location, but also Sheffield, England, Brooklyn, New York, Albuquerque. So um, really, really nice to see people showing up live. Um, so if you've got a question, please type it in. But otherwise, uh, yeah, anyone want to want to get started? Something that I want to say is what I often feel grateful for while well, it poses its own challenges because we're talking about and I noticed in each we often bring up like making time for yourself um, in this whole process is so important. But sometimes I'll just sit here in my studio and I'll think about how how lucky I am to be able to be creative every day, whether it's for personal reasons or business reasons, it's still creativity. And it's just parsing out like the different ways that we can be creative rather than having this one set way. Um, and so it's really, it's really wonderful because I think as, as creative business owners, we're often told, um, oh, you'll never have any time for yourself. Oh, it, it takes the joy out of it. I opened up a quilt shop and I never quilted again. And I, I, I don't know why, that is such a prevalent thing that happens to people. But luckily, I think in talking with you guys and going through these processes, I'm realizing that it could be, you could have it all and you can be creative and it can fill your well in so many different ways. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's just something that I think about and I'm so grateful for every day that I get to be creative. Mm. So That's we true. have a question from Cheryl that says, how do you get over feeling the perceived preciousness of materials when playing? Mm. That was a question that came up over in my diary quilting class last night as well. And mm. I think using literally less precious materials is a helpful way to do that. So if you, like I had a sweater that I knew I was not going to wear again, no matter what. And mm working with that is a nice way to feel like it's not precious. And so to play with cutting it in a different way. And I, I because they're sweaters, I've not been doing turned edge applique, but instead I've just been using raw edge with them, which is really uh, me breaking out of a limiting belief and way of working that I have, but definitely using, using things that are just truly less expensive is helpful for me as well as um, like remembering that if I'm curious, I'm more likely to make something that I like. On the few occasions where I have set out, like make something with a plan and I used the special fancy, like beautiful prints that I had. Uh, a lot of those are quilts that I haven't finished that are <laughs> shoved under my bed because they, they just didn't feel like me or my style. Um, so that's, one thing that I do, I know Tara, you're just incredible at giving yourself permission to say out mm -hmm. it goes. Um, yeah. I, and I, I did that even when I was really young and, and poor and starting out quilting. Um, I was like, I am going to go to the store and I'm going to dedicate a hundred dollars. And you know what? I'm not going to go out to eat or buy that latte or do that thing. And I've always just been like, a, you know, dedicate money to my practice. And it means like sometimes giving up other things. But to me, if I just go, I am going to dedicate 12 yards of fabric or six yards of fabric or whatever it is. And I think about, okay, six times, you know, I use solids, eight is whatever. And I realize, okay, I'm spending $50 on this quilt material. Mm -hmm. And it frees me, or I'm going to spend $200, whatever amount it is. If I just give myself permission to spend that money by cutting it up and throwing it away that, you know, and by throwing it away, I mean, like it becomes scrap, it becomes nothing. Sometimes I just, it, I don't know. It's just a mindset of just getting used to giving yourself permission if you can. And if you can't spend the money, then you can go find free, free clothing on the street, or there's creative reuse places, or there's so many ways to get free and cheap fabric. Mm -hmm. But once you get the free and cheap fabric, it's giving yourself permission to use it. Just use it. Yeah. You can get more. Well, and even the expensive fabric, I think there's sometimes a barrier for people, myself included, mm -hmm. where you buy some collection that's come out. I got some Carolyn Friedlander back here that is pretty old and that's precious to me, right? 
and I haven't used it and it's bit, but I take it from place to place every time I move a studio or whatever. And then you really do have to question and say, well, why is this precious to me? Why am I, am I scared? Am I just scared to cut into it and risk putting it into something that I don't love? Um, is that it? Because if there's no real emotional t attachment to those little bundles that are sitting folded up, use them, cut them up unless you like, what's stopping you? It's, it's all a risk, but if you really love that fabric, you will use it. It deserves to fulfill its destiny. <laughs> I look at it now. It's like when I, when my kids don't eat all their food and I'm like, it needs to fulfill its, it was grown. It, it came on a truck. We bought it. We cooked it. You need to eat it. So it can mm -hmm. fulfill its destiny. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with fabric. If it's sitting on the shelf, it deserves, and you love it. It deserves to go into something, even if it doesn't turn out to be the perfect project. So I yeah. think it's like break that mental barrier and allow yourself to cut it up. Is it? <laughs> I mean, whose phrase of is it fulfilling its destiny? When you were yeah. you know, yeah. that moment, I was like, oh yeah, I I think the same thing, but it's more, you know, is this fabric living its best life? And yeah. especially it if deserves. it's one that's so good and so be, and it's you know, it could be some vintage thing that I found somewhere for free, or it could be something I spent a lot of money went on when I was like in Korea. I bought a lot of beautiful fabric, and in India. Um, and yeah, like, is it fulfilling its destiny? Is it living its best life? And that connects so much to that microcosm, macrocosm idea that I was mm -hmm. sharing as well. Like you want, mm -hmm. you want it to be its best self. Yeah. And is it doing that in a box? Probably not. So mm -hmm. keep it going. Yeah. yeah I totally 100% all of those things. And especially that, because I, I just think about, you know, the quilts that I enjoy using the most or I'm most happy about. It's like, I just enjoy it, seeing those fabrics, it, like the fabrics or whatever it was, the components make that quilt that much more enjoyable. And to me, it's just like very, it relieves a lot of like pressure or something. Um, especially when you have these like perfect bundles and stuff that's like so neat and clean. I just think about how nice it feels when you've been able to use something mm -hmm. that you really enjoy that much in a project. Um, so that's a big one for me is yeah. Thinking about the end point, just that feeling <laughs> and also like kind of recognizing how stressful it can kind of be to have all of these perfect and precious things that you can't touch <laughs> and, um, that that's like that kind of runs counter to really feeling um, confident and in exploring something that you want to explore. So um, especially I, I try to do this whenever, you know, if I'm out somewhere, you know, and there's like a great shop and I found some great fabric when I get home, I try to cut into it right away <laughs> so mm -hmm. that it doesn't hit that like pristine, untouchable status. I'm not always perfect at that, but it's something that I'm definitely aware of when I come home. Um, after getting something really exciting, um, try to get it in play pretty quickly. And then the other thing I was thinking of too, is just that scraps for me, scraps are really great because, um, I don't feel like I have to mess anything up to, to dive into them. So they're very approachable in that way. Um, and they're often a very good gateway <laughs> to kind of loosening up. Um, so yeah, I love scraps for that reason. Mm -hmm. Tara, I loved the line that you repeated many times about a lie that I was telling myself. And I think, you know, that's just so easy to, like, it's so helpful when you're able to identify things like that. Same as like, oh, I, I had this rule that I wasn't aware of that I couldn't do raw edge or I couldn't overlap lines of quilting or I couldn't, you know, do whatever it is. And I wonder if we could speak a little bit to like, how do you figure out what is the lie you've been telling yourself or what is that rule that you have? And like, how do you smoke it out? How do you find it? I mean, if I was a praying person, <laughs> me too, because that's like... I mean, sadly for me, those revelations happen when they're ready. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, have a way to ferret it out because uh, well, I not, get yeah. trapped in them. That's why I feel like the community aspect for me has was mm -hmm. like 
allows me to see other perspectives. So yes. when you sit with other quilters and you see the work they're doing, you're like, wait a minute, why can't I try that? And then that helps me to realize what the lies are that I've been telling myself is Absolutely. not it's working in a silo, right? I'm getting yeah. out there and connecting with other makers and artists and that I think that's so. such a good point, Libs, because yeah, I mean, this revelation, what I was, when we uh, were talking the other day, that, that um, the revelations that I've been having this week, I know come directly from the couple of months of talking with you guys and creating the creative habits class and thinking about these things and writing and playing. And um, yeah, I think that there's a real benefit to not being in isolation because when I'm in isolation, which we mostly are when we're creating, um, I definitely get stuck in my same path. It's not a rut, it's just a path that I follow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then there are those two, you know, like the, the revelation you had about you can be both an artist and a business. You can, you can have both. You're still an artist, even if you're doing this for a living um mm -hmm. in whatever capacity that is um but there will just be some days where you're more focused on having to write newsletters and or focus on mm -hmm. prepping a workshop versus making the art that you want to make and that's just the trade-off right it's balancing mm -hmm. all out. Mm -hmm. but it just, yeah yeah mm. Yeah, that's so true. Seeing someone else doing, so, you know, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And then also, God, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such incredible permission to, to try something and to also know that you have had some kind of rule. Uh, in connection to community and building communities, I wonder if we could each share a little bit about what we've got going on now and ways to connect a little bit, because certainly our class that we taught together, Creative Habits, is now available on demand. So that's something that you can join and experience. If these ideas have got you cooking, there is so much richness in that series that we taught together. So that link is in the caption for this video. And we would love to have you join us in that class and use the hashtag. It's something that we're continuing to pay attention to that we're all following on our Instagram feeds. And, and so that would be a great way to connect, but there's also new things coming up. I know all three of, all four of us will be at QuiltCon in February. Um, Carolyn will have a booth and the rest of us will be teaching there. So um, a part, you can share a little about what you'll be doing at QuiltCon as well as other things that are on the horizon. And anyone who's ready to start can start. <laughs> I'll go first. Okay, I'll go. Um, boy, I've got a lot. The, January has not been the most creative month. It's really like the and I and I should also say as a quick aside, Tara, you were saying how lucky you feel to do this every day. And this month has not has been more like I think I put pressure on myself. Like I want to just be creative. Maybe I need to start a hundred day project. Blah blah. blah. And I realized nope, January <laughs> is just not the month for that. <laughs> because I was planning out all these other things and I had to like let it go and like get upset about it and just move on. Um, I'll get to the 100 day project. But right now uh, I'm planning a lot of, I've got a lot of online workshops that I've been scheduling um, and I'm planning, prepping my QuiltCon workshops. So I am doing Embrace the Chaos, which is a really fun, random um, uh, project where we everyone ends up with a different quilt at the end of the class and then I'm teaching some why scenes workshops um, and then eventually a lot of the workshops that I've been working on I'm recording so those will also be on demand which is great and I love I mean the one thing I love in-person classes because you get to be right one-on-one -on -one with people um, but the virtual sessions have been great too because I'm meeting people from places where not everyone gets to travel um, and connecting with people far away. Uh, and then in addition to that, I have Patreon. Um, so it's patreon.com slash Libs Elliot, two T's on Elliot. And we're starting up some, I've been doing like Whip It Wednesdays. We get on online on Wednesdays and, and sew for an hour and show each other the progress on projects we're working on. But I'll be expanding that to to um, capture more uh, of my community members who mm. can't meet up on Wednesday afternoons, fair enough. <laughs> so we'll be doing some evening sessions and I've just been really enjoying um, spending those one hour sessions connecting with other 
quilters and sharing ideas and just chatting. So that's really where I'm at. Just a lot of planning and scheduling, <laughs> mm. hopefully creating soon. Mm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll go next. Um, yeah. So definitely quilt, quilt con is front of mind for me right now. Uh, as Heidi mentioned, uh, for the first time, I'm going to have a booth. I've not had a booth at quilt con before. So it's a new experience and I'm very excited about it because one of the reasons that I wanted to have a booth was just because um, in years past I've, I've taught, which is such a great experience at QuiltCon, but um, when you're teaching and in a classroom, you're only with 24 students at a time. So I was really excited about the opportunity to have a booth and um, with the goal to hopefully interact with many more people. And so um kind of the theme for the booth is fun. We're going to have a fun time. Um, it's been fun thinking about uh, the product to have in there and um, how to put it all together. And um, I've got a couple of good friends coming to help out in the booth. Um, and I think my sister's coming along too. It's been a while since she's been able to join me at a quilting event. She's been having babies, but she's <laughs> ready to come back. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very exciting. I'm very excited about that. Um, and then, yeah, otherwise I announced, uh, some other events that I have, uh, on the calendar through July. So you can definitely check out my website, um, for those events, um, which is carolynfriedlander.com. And otherwise I, I do, you know, I've got new patterns in the works and other new stuff that will be coming out throughout the year. And, um, I do write a weekly ish newsletter, um, which is a place that I try to, um, I don't know, it, 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 it can definitely wander, but it is usually just creative things that I'm thinking about every week um, and leaving that fairly open-ended. So I'll share projects that I'm working on, other things that I see in the, the world that I'm inspired by. And for me, it is just kind of a nice creative outlet um, to think about each week and a way to connect with others. So if anyone's interested, you could definitely sign up for my newsletter by going to my website. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what's going on with me. Awesome. Dang. Um, yes. I, let's see what I have a lot going on, but um, the main things is I'm scaling back my teaching, which is, uh, you know, a shift from the last few years. And um, I am scaling up, releasing a bunch of patterns that I've been sitting on for the last four years uh, that I've been writing for like a, you know, a, a membership group. So I'm releasing those. I'm releasing the next six in February, along with video, uh, video classes, like mini workshops. So that's been exciting. Um, and I am teaching at QuiltCon. Uh, I am looking forward to that. It's the only live event, you know, in-person event, I should say, um, that, that I'm doing this year. Yeah, so I'm really looking for. I'm really looking forward to that. It's so fun. I uh, wear myself out though every every dang time. I'm like by Sunday, I'm like a zombie. Um, because boy, I, I you know I love teaching. I get all like excited and hyper, and I think after four days of just being all, yeah, <laughs> it's so exhausted. Um, <laughs> and then can I still share my screen? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so then I do have a, like a zoom class coming up and I'm really excited about this. This is beginning of February and it's, um, creating string, well, all kind of string pieces, but we're going to start with just one thing, which is the string star quilt. Um, and it's using up your scraps, you know, like all those like sad, sad, lonely strings that are sitting around unused, not living up to their best potential. Is that what you said, Libs? So, um, so I have that class coming up. So I'm excited about that because I'm really not going to be teaching too much on my own platform this year. I don't have too many classes planned. So, um, but I really do love teaching. It gives me so much energy. So I'm excited about that. And I, you know, you can find me at Tara Fonin because uh, it's, it's an easy name to find. Not easy to say, but it's easy to find me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so you'll you guys can find me here on YouTube. I'm trying to continue to have a conversation every month, even though I won't be doing soft bulk with Zach and Luke on a monthly basis. That'll be three or four times a year. Uh, it feels so energetically wonderful to stretch out and have different conversations with mm. different groups and 
So I'm, I'm very excited about the person I'm hoping to talk with in February. And it's just such, such a special thing to get to have shared this conversation today as well. I am in the midst of teaching diary quilting. And if you are excited to be able to do that live and have that in-person interaction with me, there is still space in the Tuesday class. So we've had two sessions already. We're going to have two more sessions. So there's lots of time to catch up with the recordings and then interact live and, and have that personal feedback like Kasha had asking about making it beautiful. But in February, I will also be launching an on-demand version of diary quilting. It won't have the conversations with current students, but it will be me synthesizing and condensing what happened in diary quilting so that you can do an on-demand version of that class. I am hoping in the future to teach a class on, um, a kind of a, sh a short class on Instagram and my approach to being online that way. And also a class in the fall on quilted clothing. There's a quilted tank top that I've made as well as lengthening that pattern to be a quilted dress. So I'm hoping to teach a class on that in the fall. If there are other classes that you're eager to get from me, send me a DM. That's a really powerful way to get me to consider to teach a class. These two classes that I'm planning are because people expressed interest in them. And then I have a lot of on-demand classes available already. And those are things that can be done with me. I've got several, several times I'm going to be teaching in person this year. And I feel so in awe and lucky that they're all sold out already. So uh, if you want first dibs to know what I'm doing, the place to find that is my monthly newsletter. Um, beautiful. So um Elizabeth shared a while back in the chat that if you are struggling to cut into fabric, a glass of wine can do the trick as well. And that is totally something we've talked about as a team also. So um, anything that can release the inhibitions, good music also can get you in the zone and feeling free. Uh, yeah. Any, any last closing comments? Are we ready to say goodbye. Okay. I think so. this was really nice and enjoyable to have a chat about mm -hmm. living a creative life and where we're all at now compared to six months ago. And yeah, it's exciting to see updates from everybody and, and connect with others on YouTube live. I think this is the first YouTube live I've ever been on. So very exciting. Me too. <laughs> <The future. laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah, you guys saw the back end. It's like way harder than I thought it would be. It's not like <laughs> going live on YouTube, but <laughs> now that I've learned how to do it, I can't forget how to do it. So, <laughs> so you got to keep that muscle memory going once a month. Uh, thank you, everyone, very much. Please like the video, subscribe, add something in the chat at the bottom. I do check in on those. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much everyone. for the invite. Okay, so the stream is ended. We are. <laughs>